we're starting with some pairings of different teas. Um, and my name is Kim Larkin, and I've been here uh, quite a few times. I am from Connecticut, from Cheshire, Connecticut, and I've been an art teacher for the past 20 something years. And I still teach art, but I uh, started a commercial chocolate business about, I don't know, almost 14 years ago. And I converted part of my home, uh, my garage, into a Willy Wonka chocolate factory. <laughs> so uh, when my daughters were little, I used to work in my workshop at night. Uh, and I was working at my library for many years teaching art programs. And uh, my librarian asked me, maybe, could you put some uh, food pairing programs together? So I was really lucky to be able to do so. And uh, I'm highlighting today my love of tea and chocolate. Uh, and we have cheese, too, which we're going to have an interesting pairing at the end, cheese and chocolate. I do that many times in my wine programs. Oh, yes, wine is another love of mine, but you're not at that program today. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, but I want to start with our tea. And our tea is a lemon ginger base, and it has uh, fresh ginger in it. So before we begin, does anybody have any allergies to anything? Gluten, because we have some uh, tea-infused baked goods as well. Anything? That's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to get the tea in your hand. And then when you sip it, you'll be able to ta really taste the flavor of the lemon and the ginger. And we're going to pair it with our, uh, our cookie. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Just take a sip and then you can save a little. We have plenty for later. Oops. It sticks sometimes. <laughs> um, and so you can get that on your palate, especially the ginger. So you'll be able to really taste the ginger, the fresh ginger in there and the lemon. So usually in these programs, I'll always be, bring excuse me, a tea-infused baked good. So I've always loved to play with different ingredients. And during my time as an art teacher, I've developed uh, aromatherapy programs. And really, tea is a form of aromatherapy, uh, especially the essential oils in the tea and the healing properties of tea. So I'll explain that in a bit. But that's why I started infusing some baked good. Uh, so today we have a lemon cookie but it has the tea that you're having, it's steeped in there. So it has a lemon infused uh, um, tea with the ginger. It's got some fresh lemon juice in it. And then the glaze also has the tea in it. So hopefully you'll be able to taste it uh, together when it's paired, okay. These came out rather big. Thank you. So I hope you're hungry. I don't know, usually I make them smaller, but. Is Bigger is better. Look at the size of that. That's your lunch. So hopefully you can taste the lemon, the fresh lemon. Many times I'll also infuse the chocolate with essential oils or with uh, uh, fresh rinds. And that is really a form of aromatherapy. So I want to talk to you today about the history of chocolate, the history of tea, how to brew a proper cup, and um, then we're gonna pair a little bit of cheese. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about cheese too. I spent a summer, last summer actually, um, at a cheese, a famous little cheese shop in my area. And I was their oldest apprentice ever. <laughs> Doing an internship over the summer. I used to work in a cheese shop when I was in college and I wanted to learn more about it because, uh, and take a nice refresher course uh, for my wine. But of course tea, uh, pairs really nicely, believe it or not, with the cheese and the dark chocolate. Uh, there are many different types of pairings you can have with uh, different types of stronger cheeses and dark chocolate. So we'll, we'll finish with that at the end. But uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, the history. What I found it very interesting and I hope you do too. So this is a little bit about how chocolate is processed. Uh, where does our chocolate come from? First of all, you probably heard that chocolate is uh, sort of an endangered crop at the moment because of the climate change. So people that actually uh, produce the chocolate on the cocoa plantations or the cacao plantations uh, usually live there with their families and they actually harvest this year round. Even though the tree produces these uh, cabasas or pods on the tree, it, they flush about twice a year, so they have to harvest them. 
The interesting thing about the chocolate is, is that all the chocolate in the world uh, is harvested by hand because they are not able to bring machinery into these tender tropical rainforest regions. So um, the people that live there have to sometimes scale the trees. Sometimes they can grow up to 35 feet tall. And these pods or cabasses have to be taken off the bark of the tree with a machete. So that's the first beginnings of the, uh, you know, the harvesting. Once they take the pod off, then they split it open. And down below here, when you come up later, you'll see there is pulp inside uh, encasing the cacao beans. And my travels around, um, I, t I do these programs in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New York. And so I've met a lot of people that have, are from these regions, and they actually used to open up the pods on the way home from school and eat the pulp as a snack. It's citrusy in nature, and they actually say it has a pink cast to it. So, but it's um, high in vitamin C. But if you're processing it, you have to remove the pulp. And you know what a pain that is to take pumpkin seeds out of pulp. That's really a pain in the neck. So they have to remove that. And then there's actually parchment over the bean. And then after you have that, I just made a little model to show you since I'm pretty visual myself. So this pod, or this pod actually, would be easier to see, is this hanging split open without the pulp. And these are all the cacao beans that chocolate is made from. And so um, an interesting fact, I think, is that um, in one pod that's harvested, there are about 60 beans in a pod. And if you need to make one pound of processed chocolate, which is not much at all, that would be 10 of these pods. There's 600 beans in just one pound of processed chocolate. So you can imagine uh, the consumption around the world and the work that goes into it. Uh, and so after they take the beans out, then they roast them and crush them. And that's where you get cacao nibs. So this is something that's readily available at stores now. Trader Joe's has them. But years ago, you know, you couldn't get these. This is considered one of the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, uh, cacao nibs. And if you're interested, there's a really great book by David Wolf. Um, He's from California, so his nickname is David Avocado Wolf, see? So my daughters were in California, and when I went to visit them, they actually use these to even encrust steak or meat, like peppercorn, like steak au poivre, similar, because it's uh, astringent in nature. But so this is the bean. This is the bean crushed and roasted without sugar. So this is the beginning of chocolate. And if you want to take that further, they take these nibs and crush it under pressure. And you're going to get a paste that is um, something called uh, cocoa liqueur. And that's where chocolate begins. But the Dutch actually figured out that if you took that wet paste and you put alkaline salts in it, then salt drawing out moisture um, would re have the remainder, uh, which was uh, cocoa powder. That's how they figured out in order to um, manufacture cocoa powder. So if you're eating cocoa powder, especially something that you see now, which is raw cacao powder that you've seen in the stores versus the regular Dutch process cocoa, if you're a baker, Dutch process is with the alkaline salts and the raw is natural. So that's also excellent for you um, in the natural state. But lucky for you, we don't have chocolate not in its natural state. So. The first thing that we're going to try with our second tea is going to be some bark. I always bring a bark um, that I make. I really love textures with my chocolate and, um, and it sort of gives it a little bit of heft to it and a little bit of complexity, of course, because of the additional ingredients. And we're going to pair it with our second tea, which is really interesting and it's made in Massachusetts, so you may have had it before. So in the bark. Uh, you start out with a tempered chocolate, which is a 68% cacao. So 68%, you've probably seen that in the candy aisle. If you buy a bar that's 68%, the remainder of that percentage, the 32% is sugar. Uh, and milk chocolate would be 33%. So that's only one third cacao and two thirds sugar. And uh, does anybody like white chocolate? So white chocolate, does white chocolate have chocolate in it? What do you think? No, no chocolate, no cacao in it at all. So white chocolate actually came about um, by the Dutch figuring out that they were uh, sort of getting rid of the excess cocoa butter 
in the production of the other chocolates. And the bean, the cacao bean, half of it is natural fat, is the cocoa butter. So they were tossing the cocoa butter and they decided to add sugar to it. So that's why white chocolate is so creamy because that's the cocoa butter with the sugar. Uh, so anyway, 68% is what we're trying right now. The tart is a Belgian chocolate, which is a I really like. I've gone to the chocolate shows and tried a bunch of different chocolates, and I really like this. It has nice vanilla notes to it. And it also has a little bit of a caramel flavor, so it's going to pair nicely with our second tea, and it is uh, sort of a blending. So it is um, a, a blended tea is called a tisane or tisane in France. In uh, French, excuse me. And so that's basically just a blended tea, uh, teas that you put together to blend to get the flavor that you like. So the tea is um, called a nutmeg bourbon tea. There's no liquor in it, but there's a lot of other really interesting spices. So there's mace, uh, which you don't see too often anymore, cinnamon, um, nutmeg, and it's a base of rooibos tea. So does anybody like red rooibos tea? So you like the red. Has anybody had the green rooibos? So it's used many times as a base in teas and it's pretty neutral in flavor. I like the green. When I tried the red, I first thought, um, where do, have I smelled that cherry, cherry flavor, that strong cherry note before? And I thought, oh, that's like Robitussin. That's how strong I thought. Medicinal. And it is a medicine in South Africa. Rooibos tea is treated uh, or used to treat a lot of uh, skin conditions and uh, used as a medicine. So the base of this is a rooibos tea with all those spices and uh, that's a tea guys and then I added some other spices to it. And with the bark, what do we have in the bark? So it's a tempered product which means that uh, it's shelf stable. So shelf stable means it's been tempered and so if I make this today and I keep it at the correct temperature where it's covered, um, you would try this in a year and you would swear it was made yesterday because the fats in it are shelf stable. So it's gonna be, have that nice snap to it. Whereas if you melt chocolate at home in a microwave uh, and you make bark yourself, it would be delicious, but maybe a few days later it might get that like gray cast to it. That's the cocoa butter in it. It doesn't affect the flavor, but it affects the texture because the toco the cocoa butter is out of temper, okay? In this bark, we have natural coconut. So it, th that gives it a nice crunch. We have Celtic sea salt. We have uh, cranberries that are infused with a little blueberry, um, and then natural pumpkin seed, okay? So we'll see what you think of that. I'm gonna give you the chocolate so you can get the chocolate on your palate first, okay? Let it melt on your tongue a little bit and coat your palate and uh, then we'll get you the tea. You're welcome. <laughs> you can just take that bowl if you don't mind. Thanks. Thank you. There you Thank go. You. You're welcome. Thanks. We need to get you guys some tea, right? We'll catch you up. Oh, look at that from both ends. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to follow up with the tea. So you'll see right off the bat that this has a darker cast to it. It has a lot of spices. I mean, I can smell it from here. It's really nice. And we have plenty more of this tea. If you do like it later, you can uh, have a nice hot cup. You can smell it. Can you smell it? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's very strong. I like it. Oops, thank you. You're welcome. So what do you think of that second one? Can you tell it's heavier in nature, right? It can stand up to the different textures. It's very spicy. Uh, but that's made in, uh, is it Watley Mass, I believe? It's a new company, and I really like a lot of the uh, natural ingredients they use. So. Um, so that's one way you can pair the heavier teas with the darker chocolates. That's a really nice way to do so. All right, so this, I was telling you about how it's processed. So where did it come from? Who figured out about cacao? So um, it first started with the Olmec Indians in the 1500s and the Aztecs and Montezuma. 
and his people actually would drink cacahuate, which is the cocoa or the cacao nibs steeped in hot water. And they drank it as a medicine and only the men would drink it. It gave them lots of energy, so they used it before they went on hunts, etc. Um, and they believed it really kept the tribe uh, strong and healthy because cacao in its natural form is loaded with antioxidants and minerals. And uh, it's very high in magnesium as well, amongst a million other things. It, it's very healthy for you. So they drank that and they shared that information with the Spanish. And Cortez took that information and some of the cacao beans back to Spain. And then he shared it with the Spanish uh, monks who sort of adapted it because it was very bitter. It's uh, cacahuete actually translates to bitter liquid. So that's actually what that means. And actually I just read another article which I, I had never seen before, but they said because that cacao bean was high in fat, remember I was mentioning half of its fat? So they'd have it, it would be like a taste greasy. So they actually put cornmeal, which even sounds worse, doesn't it? Cornmeal and hot water to absorb the fat. So um, that was another way they drank it. And the Spanish uh, monks added indigenous wildflowers and honey to sort of adapt it to their palate. Then it started to make its way around Europe and um, the Irish um, were sort of uh, discovering it. People were making things called cake chocolate. So it would be these nibs crushed as best they could. They didn't have hydraulic presses back then. This is like in the 1760s, so they probably used the grist mills and they would compact it together. And many times they would scrape it into um, hot milk to drink as a drinking chocolate. Um, and that's where Cadbury, uh, John Cadbury, who is a Quaker, he actually made his money not in the biscuits, but he actually made his millions grinding cacao nibs by mortar and pestle, um, a, you know, per person that came into his shop and would make drinking chocolate. So he would flavor the chocolates. And I actually read that he actually used jasmine and natural flowers and spices to flower, uh, excuse me, to scent the drinking chocolates. So that's how he made his money, um, developing that. Um, so when the Irish found out about the, that cake chocolate, the legend has it that there was a man, John Hannon, and he actually was from Ireland and he heard from his relatives in uh, Dorchester, Mass, that there was a person that was very wealthy that wanted to start the first North American chocolate mill. So there wasn't anything around before that. And so he came over to meet this man and he had the knowledge of how to make the cake chocolate and this man had the finances. And so they, um, they came together and they built uh, Baker's Chocolate. If you've gone to Dorchester and seen it, now it's condos, right? Uh, but I actually had someone, an elderly gentleman in my program um, about a year ago who came up to me and wanted to share that he was a little boy when they were around and he would walk to school and smell the chocolate being melted in the air, so. Um, but that's a postcard of the size of Baker's Chocolate, which is pretty amazing. They probably employed the whole town, I'm sure. Um, but John Hannon knew how to make the chocolate, so he used to go over to the West Indies to get the beans. And there was even lore that he had to sneak the beans past the, the guards at the Boston port, um, the British guards. Um, but then he finally went over once and never came back, so they don't know how he passed. But Baker still continued and stayed in that family. So after that, then it started making, making its way around Europe. And of course, the Italians put their little spin on it. And because they uh, have a lot of hazelnuts and they use that in their baking, they started adding gianduja. Or um, I'm Italian, so I ate a lot of that hazelnut chocolate when I was little. And so that's a nice paste that they added to it. And Napoleon even sort of um, was responsible for that because he started blocking cacao coming into the ports in Italy. And so the bakers in Italy uh, would have to sort of figure out how do we stretch this cacao. And so they added a lot of the hazelnuts and that's how they came up with that product. And then we have um, the Swiss who did the uh, Toblerone bars, the nougat and the almond. So everybody put their little twist on it. 
And finally, with um, bakers being here, uh, people around the United States started getting in on the act. Gear Deli, of course, in San Francisco, Guitard. And they were in the right place because the gold miners around the 1840s, I think, they were uh, looking to strike it rich. And so they were actually trading chocolate. Gear Deli was trading chocolate and mining tools for gold nuggets. Uh, with the miners. Uh, so they, that was a, a good uh, barter, that's for sure. And, um, and then as we move along, Lint, Rudolph Lint, you've had Lint. I really love their dark, dark chocolate. If you ever want to get into a dark, dark chocolate, 85, 92, I think they have the best commercial chocolate. It's very smooth for something that is very low in sugar. Um, so Lynn was not only a chocolatier, but he changed the face of chocolate because he actually came up with this really interesting machine called the conching machine, which was actually two paddles um, that blended the chocolate, and it was named for the shape of the paddles, which looked like the conch shells. And it reduced the manpower of sort of, you know, blending the chocolate by hand to really making it smooth and viscous. So, of course, people were uh, eating the chocolate before, and it is most likely pretty gritty, you know. But through his process of inventing this machine, it became very smooth and velvety, so that appealed to a lot more people. So Rudolf Lint came on the scene, and then we have Nestle, right? And uh, his neighbor, it was unbelievable the way uh, synchronicities happened, but this man, Daniel Peter, was Henri Nestle's neighbor, and they were both wanting to come up with um, um, sort of a recipe for milk chocolate. Nobody had come up with that yet. But if you're a baker, you know you cannot add liquid to chocolate. Uh, it will seize, it will harden up, and there's no way that you can reverse that. So they couldn't add milk to milk chocolate, so they come up with some, uh, you know, uh, chemical, food, food chemist process to create the milk chocolate. And supposedly that took them eight years to create milk chocolate, but they formed the Nestle Company. And then there's um, Milton Hershey, of course. He uh, was first known when he was very young, he started his business at 18 and he was known as the king of the caramels. He made a perfect caramel and made a lot of money at that, but he wanted to make the perfect chocolate bite, which was the, uh, the kiss, of course. But um, if you've ever wanted to find out a little bit about him, he was a really interesting man. His autobiography tells about how he went bankrupt a couple of times. He married, but he could never have children, but they really loved children, so they started orphanages and schools that still exist today. And he was the one that convinced the government to um, include uh, ration bars of chocolate. Of course, it was the Hershey's bar, of course, right? Um, and then um, one of my students in my art class, a little nine-year-old, came up to me and said, which I had never read this, even in his autobiography, Miss Kim, did you know that Milton Hershey was supposed to be on the Titanic that fateful day? Has anyone heard of that? Did you hear it? Yeah, it's, I couldn't believe it. And I'm, I'm saying to my little student, where did you read that? <laughs> so, but uh, you can go and look and see the manifest ticket on, online. So isn't that amazing? You know, thank goodness he skipped that uh, trip, right? Um, so I forgot to ask you, what do you think of the, uh, the bark with the complexities? Does anybody just like prefer like plain chocolate over thing with textures? Anybody? Do you like the texture? I like plain. Plain. Do you like milk? Do. Yeah, so you have a, you're a purist, huh? But I tried, um, I never hated dark chocolate before, but yeah. now that was really good. That yeah, was well we have dark. something a little darker, yeah. but it'll be interesting to see what you think of that pairing. Um, so that's what we're going to try next, okay, um, if you're up to it. Are you up to a little bit of an experiment? Yes? Sure. All right, very good. <laughs> All right, so normally I uh, would serve this with, in a tea program, I'd serve it instead of our, our spicier tea. Sometimes I'd serve it with an oolong tea. Oolong is, and there's something called a dragon well oolong that has a tiny bit of apricot flavor to it. So that is really a nice pairing. It's known as a pairing to uh, serve with uh, dark chocolate if you're, if you're not uh, drinking wines. Uh, but today we're going to just pair it with our cheese instead. So why do these go together? Well, you'll find out 
you know, subjectively it'll be your decision whether they go together or not, but normally they do because what we have is a 70%, 78% cacao. So now we're getting up there in the healthful range, right? So 78%, so we have less sugar in it. So how do you balance it out? If you're not drinking a glass of wine, which has the natural residual sugars in it, right? How do you balance it out? So with this cheese that we have, it is a three-year age Australian cheddar. It has a real kick to it. And when you have something that's aged in an aged cheese, um, the water wicks out over time and the fat is more condensed in the cheese. And also the sugars are more um, prominent on your tongue, whether you believe it or not, you can taste it. Sometimes if you've ever had an aged cheddar or an aged cheese, you've tasted those crystals in it as well. So that's maybe what you'll taste in this. But it should be pairing sort of interestingly, especially with the sugar. So you can do it either way. You can either way. You can either take a bite of the cheddar, let it melt on your palate, so make sure your palate's coated, and then chase it with the darker chocolate, or you can do it in reverse. So you have to have something on your tongue, you know. Um, you can do the dark chocolate and have the cacao uh, salads on your tongue and follow up with the cheese, okay? But you're not allowed to eat it individually. You have to be brave about these things. We have plenty of tea, all right, if you're, you're not liking it, okay? Help yourself. Oh, you have to eat them together. Yes, you do. You just heard the rules, right? Yeah. All right. So when you see the chocolate, or if you've had the 78 before, it's a lot more dense. I'm just going to try the chocolate. Oh my goodness. I'm not going to comment. I'm not going to comment on that. All right. All right. Uh, the darker chocolate is, you know, it has a different texture to it. There's less sugar, so you'll, you'll just see the difference. Oops, I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. What am I doing? Here we go. I'll switch that way. Yeah, I'll do it like this. All right, I'll hold it like this. Don't let me leave. Okay, look. Look at that. Now that I've been shamed into it, right? Duh. Can you imagine when I have like 50 people what it's like? <laughs> All right, let's, so let's see your, uh, your decision. I'm not going to you. <laughs> I love that they're talking with things together. That's very good. Interesting. Yes. What do you think? <laughs> Yay or nay? She's not sure. She's processing. Processing, <laughs> processing. All right. All right, while you're deciding on that, okay, uh, I'm going to continue. So how do you brew a proper cup of tea? Okay, so I have an English neighbor. Many years ago, I invited her over for tea, and she schooled me on that. So I'm gonna share if you haven't, if you haven't um, done that before or used anything that is uh, a tea processed in a stoneware pot, this is the way to do it. So basically, uh, what you're going to do is, the most important thing is you wanna oxygenate the water, okay, which means the rolling boil. And you should use um, spring water, not tap water. My water at home is hard water, and it has a, a funny chemical flavor to it. So I always use the spring water. And then you're going to oxygenate it and bring it to the rolling boil. And what that does is, this brings us back to aromatherapy. So there are pieces of the tea leaf and the essential oils that need to be extracted when you brew your tea. So here is the loose tea I'm sure you've seen. Whoops, loose versus the bag tea, okay? So you have bigger pieces of the leaf and, um, and even if it's an herbal tea. So herbal tea is the seeds, the flowers, the bark, that type of thing. It's still a um, healthful beverage because it's a plant. So you're getting the phytochemicals, the antioxidants from that, even though it's an herbal product. Uh, but if this is a, a regular tea leaf, which is where all these teas are from, so that would be uh, the tea leaf, which is known as Camellia sinensis. All the teas come from that that are caffeinated. So that would be white tea, 
it would be green tea, oolong, um, not rooibos, and black. And even the, uh, the uh, is it pu'er tea, the cake tea, that fermented cake tea, the Chinese cake tea, which is basically uh, known as Chinese penicillin. But anyway, the water, the, um, the oxygenated water is going to extract the essential oils and really pull out the benefits. So is the loose tea better than the bag tea? Well, yes, loose is always better to get the bigger pieces. And you can see and unscrew and smell this if you'd like. This is a, um, has an apricot base to it. But as you've noticed, um, the better teas now, like Harney and Sons, um, and some others on the market actually are using the muslin the um, muslin bags that expand. Have you seen those? Yes. So it's wonderful because they expand and if you look at the bags you can see that there are larger pieces of the tea leaf and you can see a lot more even in the herbal bags there are a lot more pieces of, of the fruit therefore you're getting you know a better product. So, um, you know, I use a lot of um, mixture of loose and bag when I travel, especially if I have large crowds, but I found, you know, through uh, finding out what is the better products, um, you really can get a great cup of tea. So basically, after you pour the tea, um, excuse me, you boil the water, you're going to pour the water into your stoneware pot, and you're going to heat up the pot. So uh, basically you're bringing the temperature up in the clay, especially if uh, it's been in your cupboard and it's cold. And a lot of people do that with the cup too. They'll warm up the teacup, warm up the china, and then you pour the water out. And then you would measure your teeth accordingly. And then this is where it's a little bit different. So what about the steeping times? So the top of these bags <coughs> tell you about the steeping times. So if you can see white tea, Will, would be steeped at a lower temp. And so I know you all have your trusty tea thermometer, right? I always say that, right? So if it's at 175 degrees, you wanna make sure that the water is lowered in temperature. So you would, if you're you know, a real aficionado, you would lower it. Um, but why does white tea need a lower temp? So white tea comes from, like we were saying, the same tea leaf as the black tea leaf. So here is how the tea is made. So white tea is actually the buds and the fresh new leaves um, of, of the tea plant, the camellia, camellia sinensis. And over here, if you're interested, it'll go white tea, and then they dry it, and they steam it, and that's white tea. That's it. It's the highest in an antioxidants because it's the least processed of all the teas. So even though it doesn't have much of a strong flavor, white tea is very healthful. And then green tea, how is it a little different? Well, the only thing is, is fermenting it, that's it. So green tea is rolled and dried and then they, they heat it a little bit. So they ferment it a little bit. And so I think this is pretty cool. Somebody figured out that in order to stop fermentation, they heat it in a wok. So they heat, heat it to stop the, the tea leaves from fermenting. But of course, green tea is excellent for you. It's got that compound EGCG in it, which is excellent for your body, excellent for your immune system. Uh, then oolong. Oolong's a mixture, semi-oxidized tea. And you get the idea. It, you move on to the full fermented black tea. So that would be like the Dublin tea, um, you know, a dark English PG tea, something, the tips. Um, and that's still very good for you because it's got all the antioxidants in it. It's just fully fermented. So that's a little bit about how that is made. So then we have um, mate. Has anybody or do, does anybody like mate tea? That uh, Argentinian tea? So it's got a little bit of natural caffeine in it. And then there's rooibos tea. That's how it's spelled if you, you haven't seen that before. And rooibos is the base of our second tea that we had. So the red rooibos that you like or the green rooibos is uh, considered really healthy. Okay, and then these numbers are the steeping times. So you can figure out you don't need to steep for long and you don't want to squeeze your tea bag because you're extracting the extra tannins and that's acidic, so you don't want to do that. You don't ever want to use another tea bag, the same tea bag, right? Don't look, anybody I can tell. <laughs> I can tell, I know the signs. I know the signs. I actually had a woman come up to me the other day. She's like, I just have to confess. I microwave my tea. I'm like, you almost made it out the door. <laughs> Why are you telling me that? 
So obviously that's the next rule. No microwaving your tea water. That's a no-no because you can't, you know, oxygenate and you're, it's going to taste terrible. Uh, so that is the story of a little bit of how to uh, process your tea. And then with um, the green tea, if you ever want to add something more healthful to your diet, you can add something called matcha. So who uses matcha on a regular basis? Anybody? No? So this is uh, another way you can include matcha into your diet. Don't, don't be sad about that. I'll tell you how to do it. So, so matcha. So tea actually um, was uh, sort of discovered in China. And then the Chinese shared the tea seeds with the Buddhist monks in Japan who brought it over to Japan. And then the Japanese Buddhist monks uh, came up with the ceremony of sado or the tea ceremony and um, they actually came up with implements to use traditional implements if you've been to a tea ceremony um, these are some of the implements that they use um, this is called a chasen and this is a chashaku this measures the tea and this whisks it so here's a little something you can look at later if you're interested if you see this bowl that's how um, the matcha, which is uh, concentrated green tea powder, is put in the bowl and then added with the hot water and they whisk it till it's very frothy. You see how green that is, right? So I have an old one that I've traveled around with. This has uh, lost its color a little bit, but this is what matcha is. But in actuality, the tea that they use, and if you'd want to add this to your diet, you would use something called ceremonial grade green tea. So you can't just go online and just order anything, but you really don't know what it is. So you wanna make sure it's organic and that it's vetted, that it's ceremonial grade because they use the better quality tea. And the jade tea, this is also known as jade tea because of the color, of course that's super high in chlorophyll, right? Because it's high in that uh, high green color. Uh, it is uh, uh, sort of grown so that they shade the leaves of the tea plant until it, it increases the chlorophyll content. So it's very good for you, excellent for you. So um, what they do is in the tea ceremony, you're going to be given this little cup. Um, sometimes, you know, if you go to church and they have the chalice, which they pass around, sometimes they'll do in the ceremony, they'll do the large bowl and it will be a communal bowl and everybody sips and then it will be transferred and everyone would get their little uh, stoneware bowl. But the idea behind the tea ceremony is that um, it's really not about drinking the tea, it's about meditation, right? In communion with your, um, your peers and being in the tea house um, where it's uh, quiet and serene. And if you wanna come and look at this a little bit later, this tells a little bit about the tea ceremony. But basically, you're supposed to be freshly bathed when you walk into the tea house. You're supposed to be silent, which I don't know if I could make it through a tea ceremony <laughs> myself, but it's a little over an hour and a half, supposedly. I've had a lot of people say an hour and a half to drink this little cup of tea. So it's not about the tea, right? It's sipping and thinking. And also you're supposed to be engaging all your senses, listening to the kettle boil, seeing people around you. Many times they'll use like the feng shui elements of heat and um, um, fire, heat, color, and flowers and things like that art to represent the beauty of life. And basically you are uh, supposed to be rooted to the earth and have your feet flush to the ground and basically just be meditative. So that's a little bit about the tea ceremony. Okay, I'm gonna ask you some questions now that you're awake with tea and chocolate. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes, okay. Oh, also, um, the benefits of dark chocolate, just to tell you before I forget, because I want you to try and incorporate it. It's really great, incorporate it into your diet. Um, does anybody eat dark, dark chocolate as a regular part of their diet? You do. So what's the percentage? Oh, good for you. Good for you. All right, I have to tell this story. I tell it at every program, so you may have heard it, but I think it's so funny. So I was at a program a few years ago in Massachusetts, and I was doing a Celtic program, uh, and uh, we were having the Dublin tea. So I asked if anybody had the dark chocolate, and this woman in her 90s 
was asking a lot of questions sitting up front. And um, so she said, I have 92% every day, a big chunk every day. That's my breakfast. And she was really animated. She's like, it gets me going for the day and just makes me power through. And so I said, oh, do you have it with uh, the Bewley's tea that we're having or another Irish tea? She said, no, I just have it with a nice shot of Jameson and I'm good to go for the day. <laughs> that is a true story. Uh, people were like howling. and I'm like, good for her. That's the way she gets through the day. And it obviously is working for her, right? So there you go. That was a good lesson. All right, so these are some questions. Um, uh, a little bit of a quiz. So let's see what you think of this. So where do you think tea bags were invented? China, the US, or Britain? Right. Um, in 1908, uh, this man, Thomas Sullivan, he was a tea merchant. And he, you know those muslin bags we were talking about? He was sewing up little muslin bags with his tea as samples for his customers. And that's where that came from. How long do you think a tea plant can live to? And the rule of tea is it has to be three feet tall and three years old before they even harvest from it. So can it live to be 25 years, 50 years, or 100 years? What do you think? 100 years. That's right. That's right. OK, does anybody know the name of the first female in this country, the first tea entrepreneur? She, it was, um, she was living in New York in the 40s, and she was blending the boring red rose teas uh, with spices from her kitchen, the nutmeg, the cinnamon, orange peel, lemon rind, um, and she served it to her friends who gave her constant comments. Bigelow. Bigelow. Bigelow, right. Ruth Bigelow, and the rest is history. Who's been to the tea plantation? Anybody? I haven't been there. That's on my bucket list. That's in South Carolina. I heard it's really awesome. I don't know, but um, I'm not sure. That's all I know, South Carolina, so I'm going to head in that direction. <laughs> but I heard, I heard it's really a great place. Um, OK, do you think you get the same benefits from hot tea versus iced tea? You, you have to, right, you have to process it as hot tea. Some people make the sun tea. You're not going to get the same benefits. But ice halts the catechins or the polyphenols, those type of uh, antioxidants. That's all that is. OK, um, what country do you think introduced iced tea in 1904? Britain, the US, or Ireland? Right, that's your standard question. That's right, all right. You're right again. All right, do you know once I did a program and I, all my answers were the C, as in ABC, and the guys were like, C? And I'm like, I need to change this up. <laughs> I didn't even know I did that. Um, so in 1904 at that famous St. Louis World's Fair, it was super hot that year, and supposedly the hot tea purveyor was next to the Iceman, and they had to combine forces for sales. Um, but I just recently read that the people in the South highly dispute that because they've been serving the sweet tea a lot earlier than that, so they, they don't believe that. Okay, so um, almost last question, what very popular tea was named for a British royal who was also a well-known abolitionist uh, in the 1800s. Uh, Prince of Wales, Earl Grey, or Joel Grey? Earl Grey. Earl Grey, right. And does anybody know the difference between Earl Grey tea and Lady Grey tea? Lady Grey was created by the Twinings in the 1990s, so that's a fairly new product. Do you know the difference between that? No, but close. One, well, they have bergamot, right. Uh, it's lemon and orange in the Lady Grey. So bergamot, this is another cool thing. I could go, as you can know, I see, I can go on and on. But bergamot is a, an essential oil, right? That is actually, which I don't think it tastes like it, but that's an orange essential oil. That's from the oranges in Calabria, Italy. Imagine that, but I don't think it tastes like it. I think it's very floral. But that, you know, some people love it or hate it for that reason. Um, but that's very good for you, too. Okay. All right, I'll give you one more. Ready? Um, we talked about John Cadbury, right, making the chocolate. So this other uh, family, Stephen Fry and his sons, he was the first guy to make uh, chocolate bars in uh, England. 
And then uh, Roundtree was also an English chocolatier too. They all were 19th century chocolatiers. They all had something in common. So were they all barristers or lawyers? Were they former soldiers or do you think they were all Quakers? Right, right. I had read that. Yeah, what's that? Oh, darn it. I knew that would come back to bite me. Darn, you're right, it is C. All right, and also my little trivia about Milton Hershey with his chocolate syrup. So his syrup, when they first discovered it in the 1960s, is the craziest packaging. And it was glass, like in a mason jar, and they actually named it Hershey's Milk Amplifier. Isn't that a terrible name? <laughs> but, they, but Alfred Hitchcock used that Hershey syrup have you heard that trivia? As the blood going down the drink. Is that a nice, I know, you'll never drink Hershey, Hershey syrup again, I'm sure. Yeah? So that's a little trivia about that. Yeah, in Psycho, that's right. That's right. Okay, let me make sure I told you. Oh, so um, dark chocolate, why should you incorporate dark chocolate? So we talked about the magnesium. It's really good, good for you. But um, chocolate is known to, dark chocolate is known to dilate the arteries and it's very good for brain cognition and reasoning. They've done studies at Washington State that have proved that it staves off Alzheimer's and helps with uh, your reasoning capacity. Um, it also lowers your LDL, which is your bad cholesterol. Um, and it's also an anti-inflammatory, so it's very good for your joints because of the natural fats in it. So there's just a variety of reasons to incorporate dark chocolate, but um, that would be just a few. And tea, we talked about it has the antioxidant qualities of um, the catechins, which are um, antioxidants, polyphenols, those are antioxidants as well. And I just wanna share this finally with you. Um, we have a lot more uh, for you to sample, obviously. But I wanted to just mention that tea really is medicine. Uh, and so these are just four teas that I've used from Republic of Tea. I really like their teas because they don't um, bleach the tea bags. They, they're very clear about where they buy, you know, and uh, purvey their, their teas from both on the farms in China and Japan. And um, so these are some healthful teas. For instance, if you've taken elderberry syrup, elderberry syrup in the winter to stave off your cold. So this is elderberry tea, organic elderberry tea. So these teas fight, help fight um, flu and um, or aid in keeping flu away, let's put it that way, and strengthen your immune system. That's been used, you know, for centuries. Then there's elderflower, which is, oops, wrong one. Elderflower is the oldest herb cultivated by man, and that's been used to help um, medicinally. Uh, sage tea is used, we cook with it, but it's used um, to help with hot flashes, believe it or not, and to sort of uh, regulate uh, your body. And then finally, dandelion tea. So being Italian, I, I ate my share of dandelion greens growing up, um, and that wasn't great. But, <laughs> but dandelion being so, um, you know, have that, they have that acidic quality. Now, I'm not a fan of the flavor of dandelion tea, but what does it do? It's the, like the number one liver cleanser for your, uh, your liver, totally cleaning out your liver. Anything that has that uh, astringency is known, like arugula, dandelion. But dandelion, you can take this tea, and we were talking about the tisane before, blending the teas. So I blend this with raspberry tea, and I can't taste um, that, you know, the soil flavor, <laughs> whatever it is, it, it masks it. So, um, you know, that's something to consider. Then finally, you can check this out um, if you're into pairing the chocolates and the cheeses and you want to put, you know, something, a fun pairing out together, a reason to have friends over with wine and chocolate and cheese. Um, basically, you're just going to mix up your, your milks. So basically, that just means if you have something that's um, a cow's milk, then you can have a goat's milk and you can have a sheep's milk, which have different amounts of fat in them. So that changes the texture. Different shapes, diff different milks, and also um, you can combine it with um, those nuts. So if you don't, 
you know, usually I'll put nuts in my bark, but not in, you know, when people have so many allergies. But you can use the Marcona almond, which is high in fat, which balances out the fat in the cheese. So the, you know, the choices are just endless with that. So, um, and this, I, you can check this out when you come up. This is actually women harvesting the tea flush. It's amazing how they uh, set up these, uh, these tea gardens. Um, especially like in the Himalayan hills. It's amazing and uh, they pluck by hand still. And a good quality tea, like a good quality white tea, which is expensive, um, you know, silver needle tea is a very well-known tea that's expensive. That could, that could possibly take up to 80,000 buds in a dry pound of tea. Imagine that, the pluckings. So the manual labor is amazing. All right, before I wrap it up, I wanted to ask you, do you have any questions for me? Yes. Um, I only drink herbal tea, and you didn't mention that word at all. Oh, I, I did, but that's okay if you didn't hear me. I, I'm going to so tell you. Is herbal tea. Rooibos is herbal. So all teas, like an herbal tea, what do you drink? Um, anything that's herbal. Okay. Herbal okay, so... Yeah, the, I mean, anything that is um, herbal would be anything that is not made from this tea leaf, the Camellia sinensis. So that would be like the, the ones you drink are the flowers, the bark, the stems, the roots. They use everything for that. And now um, the tea that you had, the second tea that you had, even had people are using coconut. They're using everything in that. Um, so you're still getting the benefits because it's a plant. It's part of a plant. And, um, you know, I mean, to go back to aromatherapy, but Aristotle believed that, you know, we're taking in the energy, the actual, actual energy of the plant when we drink, you know, the form of the plant, whether it be in the form of the berry. So you're getting, like, for instance, rose hips. If you drink something with rose hips, and that's used in a lot of herbal teas, it's excellent for you, super high, off the charts in vitamin C, so you're getting the benefits of the plants. So it's all good, even if you're not having the caffeine. Yep. Anybody else? Yes. When, what's your ratio when you mix the dandelion tea with the raspberry to not have the taste? I do um, one, one to one. Okay. Yeah, and I get like a good strong raspberry tea. That matters too. Like celestial seasonings, I think they have very excellent strong fruited teas, the herbals. So, um, and that's very strong. I've been to a lot of tea lectures, and uh, one of the first people that ran one of the lectures never called the herbals teas. She called them infusions because they weren't really tea. Yeah. Even though yeah, that's it. some people will say that, yeah. So, I don't know. Yeah, no, it just matters about what the leaf is. Yeah. What the leaf is. But so, if you don't want to have caffeine, you know, just stay with your herbal. Oh, no, Oh, you want me to? I'm all about the caffeine. Yes, now I do a coffee program, so I'm all about that, right? Tea in the morning, no. Coffee in the morning, tea at night. Herbal infusions in the evening, okay. With a little chocolate. Chocolate doesn't even bother me anymore, even at night. So some people are affected by that, but yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay. So I am going to read this to you. And then I want to encourage you to come up and sample whatever you'd like. Don't forget about the nibs if you'd like to try that. Um, they're, they're roasted and they're a little bitter, but there's something interesting. And you can include those into your diet as well, like mix them into your oatmeal or baked goods. And it, they're very healthful for you. And we have lots of tea left over too, so I can get you a nice hot cup of tea too. And I want to thank you for your, uh, your attention. Okay, so here's my poem. I always have a little poem at the end. This is called To Taste Tranquility. When I need to clear my mind and I crave tranquility, I put the kettle on the boil and I steep a cup of tea. The warm embrace of a soothing brew rejuvenates my soul anew. Tea to me means meditation, a sacred time to unwind. I tune into my quiet thoughts to calm my body and my mind. A cup of Darjeeling is very appealing. It's known as the liquid gold from the Himalayan hills. But today, as you've heard, I'm very full of Blarney, so only Dublin tea will fit the bill. Just five cups of pure green tea is said to slow our aging dramatically. And then we're supposed to drink clean white tea to tighten our skin. And oolong tea 
even claims to make us thin. But promises, promises, we'll sip and see if we transform magically. But like tea, a woman can run hot or cold, but we are all at our best when we're strong and bold. Thank you for coming. Feel free to come up and have some tea too.